Hello, Natasha. Thank you so much for being with me today. How are you? Hi, it's lovely to be here. I'm doing good. Um, so looking forward to this conversation. Fantastic. It's a pleasure to have you. Maybe you'd give us a quick introduction about who you are and what you're all about. Sure thing. So uh, my name is Natasha Guillot and my accent will have sold me out even if I live in the States now. I'm originally French. I'm still <laughs> French. And I am a French intuitive guide, a content strategist, a video consultant and a film scholar. And the biggest focus in my work is to help women decision makers and entrepreneurs reclaim their sovereignty so they can create aligned impact. Wow. OK, well, it's quite a that's quite a, a rap sheet there, isn't it? It's, <laughs> there's a lot going on from an intuitive guide to a film scholar. And what was the one in the middle? Uh, content strategies and video consultants. So. Okay, and video as well. All right, amazing. So you probably have a lot of wisdom for us today. So that's amazing. Let me begin by asking you, though, what has your experience been in your own career of empathic leadership or lack thereof? Oh, boy, where do I start with that? I know we're going to keep it short. Uh, so <laughs> so I was originally spent too many years in academia, as I joke, even though I loved it. And I have seen really the best empathetic leadership I've seen was the professor I worked with as a teaching assistant during my PhD, my first two years of PhD, because he was, he had such a good heart. He was really good at also holding space and being uh, culturally sensitive as well. We had a lot of international students and trying to be really good with us, the teaching assistants, even when we were getting our bearings in our first year, some of us international. Okay. So that was a, a really one of my best examples. Uh, I would have my other best example was like a manager I had in a previous corporate job in an international SaaS uh, company and she she understood her own limitations and was really upfront about her own you know uh neuro uh, diverse brain as well so it was really easier to be able to communicate and see what worked for everybody involved she really uh stood up for her to stood for us as well and so those are two really good examples i have now the not so good example i've seen them too uh including in a for me, it wasn't necessarily a direct manager in corporate, but like the higher ups having like no understanding whatsoever what the hell we were even doing. Mm. And it's like doing prescriptive, completely out of touch uh, demands when it's like, do you even understand who your clients are and who your team members are? So for me, that was like, wow, uh, can we can we just chill for a second and one of the big issues I had with this non-empathetic leadership was also uh, a lack for me, the lack of structure overall and communication between teams that could really throw everything off. Because even if some of us were trying our best, we basically pull, uh, got the, the rug pulled from beneath our feet so many yeah. times. It was exhausting. Okay. It's not funny like that, like it's the... It's being out of touch. It's having a lack of connection and a lack of clear communication that you end up feeling like 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 the rug's being pulled from under you. Like, you know what I mean? It's a great analogy. Um, do you think that, you know, did you feel grounded when you did have the empathic leaders? Those other do, the first two examples you gave. The first the first one, like at in higher education, yes, I did really feel grounded. That really helped me a lot. I loved the work I was doing and mm. uh that was a big factor into my first year of PhD when I I just moved to Texas from France. And so that wow, was a change. really <laughs> helpful experience. And the the more uh, I was working as well with another teaching assistant who was already, I think, on his second or third year of the program. So he was also at his level an empathetic leader. Because I think that's a, a thing often we like sometimes we tie, you know, leadership to a position, but any of us can be a leader. Wow, okay in our community, you know, whatever we do, maybe it's corporate, higher education, you know, government jobs or entrepreneurs like me. It's really like, even if you're a stay-at-home parent, you can be a leader as well. It, there's not like, you don't have to have a specific title. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that because it's such an important point, you know, and then we have our own self-leadership. You know, we lead ourselves in our lives, you know, and even being empathic to ourselves is just as important. So it's such an it's such a great point to make. Thanks a million for that. Um, 
So let's let's get into the self-compassion point here. So what does self-compassion mean to you as an entrepreneur? It's going to start with even before I was an entrepreneur because right. when it's tied together, but then there's specificity to an entrepreneur. It's like not pushing myself all the time and letting go of perfectionism because I'm a perfectionist in recovery. Uh -huh. I don't even say I'm a recovered perfectionist because just saying that is being perfectionist in nature. And I'm like, no, we're not going for that. So for me, that's a big element. And uh, and even more as an entrepreneur now, self-compassion also means being patient with myself because I'm a, I can be a very go, go, go type of person. I'm a Capricorn. I'm like, we're going to get things done. And like, I have the plan and everything. And it's like, okay, uh, can you, can you chill for a second? <laughs> it's okay. If you achieve like not 10,000 of the goals you set out in one day, you're fine. It's a process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that ties into the perfectionism, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so interesting you mentioned perfectionism because just today I had a client in my community talking about perfectionism and it comes up all of the time. And I think it's a real common experience for highly sensitives, for empathic people. And it's very closely linked to self-criticism and the expectations we have on ourselves, you know? So, you know, how do you manage those expectations? I do a lot of brain dumps and organizing notes. I know it may not be the first thing people think about, but I'm like, if I put it on paper, you know, or on the computer, it's like, I know it's going, I'm going to get there at some point. So mm -hmm. not just the to-do list or just the plan for right now. And I still love getting the to-do list done. I'll be honest, but um, it's one of the things of like, okay, even if it's out of my brain and on paper, that's going to help me be able to be like, I'm not going to forget about it or I'm not going to let it slide. I still have a lot of self-discipline, uh, but it's, uh, so it's not an, an issue I have, but it's also having this self-discipline to give myself time to do other fun stuff. And mm -hmm. for me, that can be a challenge. Uh, and it's like one of the things that helped me, you know, manage that uh, is also, also reminding myself uh, that I can take time off even if it's, you know, a few hours here and there, because even when we're very excited, like as entrepreneur, I think anybody who has, you know, a career that really excites them, it's like we want to get stuff done and we may be, you know, likely to work longer hours. And uh, sometimes it's good. I mean, I'm not against it. I mean, I'm the first to be like, I'm really excited about it. I'm in the zone. I'm in a good mood. Yeah. I'm going to work longer on that. But also like, I think the self-awareness that you don't have to do that all the time and that you may not want to do that all the time as well, because then you, you're probably going to get another VIP pass to burnout town. Yeah, oh, totally. I totally agree. Like I, I speak a lot about the an optimal energy flow, you know, because sometimes you are in the zone and sometimes you do want to maybe carry on and, and, and do those extra couple of hours work, you know, and you're thinking, well, maybe I should stop now. But it's very hard when you're maybe your creativity is flowing. You know, you want to continue on that on that wave, you know. So but it's it's about calibrating to that, isn't it? And allowing for the the two hours rest mm -hmm. following the two the extra two hours work, isn't it? Yes. And I think the self-awareness is really an important part of it, of knowing, yeah. okay, when do you keep going and when do you need to slow down? Because it's one thing to have a plan to take time off, but if you don't have the self-awareness and I think the self-compassion is kind of the bridge between the self-awareness and actually taking the steps to doing what is best for you right now, whether it's mm -hmm. the two extra hours, you know, of work because you're really in the zone or it's saying, eh, I'm going to stop early today because I can and I need it. Yeah, fantastic. It's um, I love that the, the connection. So so the self-compassion is the connection between your self-awareness and what you need to do. Is that what you said? Say that again. Yes. Yeah, did yes. I get that right? OK, <laughs> yes, yeah. you got it right. Yeah, yeah I love it. I mean, it's really it's really the bridge because like, yes, the self-awareness can be mm -hmm. one thing of like, yeah, I know, I know, blah, blah, blah. But you're just like, nah, I'm going to keep going. I'm not going to listen to myself. And the self-compassion yeah. is like, OK, what is best? Yeah. What right do I now? need right now? Yeah, exactly. OK, so how does self-compassion then influence your messaging and your content, you know, and 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 how you're how you're showing up, I suppose, and getting yourself out there as an entrepreneur? Oh, that's that's one thing that I love uh, because also, you know, I'm a content strategist and a video consultant. So that's also yeah. one thing I help my clients with. But Brilliant. 
for me, it's like not just one thing I think that is extremely important is finding, you know, like having a clear message with a clear audience and providing not only what your audience needs and wants, but find the way that it brings you joy. I know it might not be like what we first think about when it comes to content marketing, but yeah. <laughs> I'm always like, if you're going like to, like, let's say for example, that once you have your clear messaging, like it really needs to resonate with you. And that's something that, and we all need strong foundations. Again, like that's a Capricorn in me <laughs> coming up, but it's like, if you're just having a formula for your messaging, that sounds like a cookie cutter option that you heard or were told sometimes by very successful people and sometimes by people who are not as big an expert as they think they are, but you just feel stifled in it. And you're like, it's not my voice, but that's what I was told. I'm supposed to, you know, present my message this way. Like I'm all for, you know, um, psychology in how we're going to approach uh, our messaging but I also want all of us to be true to our values and that could be even how somebody in corporate you know may present themselves maybe at conferences or even within you know when they talk with their company maybe they don't have like their personal brand out there and their own business but it's even going to impact how they may present themselves you know in yeah. professional ways and and you know many of us even who may have been in corporate we may still even without a business still you know have our LinkedIn profile or maybe we have you know a side hustle or something so even if it's not a full-on uh, business that can be something that we absolutely like per everyone has a personal brand everyone who's mm -hmm. out there and has a career you know and is whether they're going for a job or whether they're pitching for for clients mm -hmm. that that personal brand comes into play for sure absolutely um, I, I really resonates what you're saying about like, you know, I've been there myself where you follow, you follow the advice of the experts, you do, you do this template or that format, or, you know, you do, you, you follow what you think you don't know, but, but I have experienced that where I've lost my voice, then I've lost the real true message that I began with you know and it's like where is it gone you know and then you kind of have to come back to it so do you see that happening with people a lot yes and I've been there too I mean I'm the first to admit I've been there too and I had like I I found I was building two different businesses who could never be reunited in one and then I had to just do things one way and then I had a lot of epiphany and like screw this moment let's say yeah, <laughs> like yeah, we're going to go back to basics and this is why, you know, finding our message back on like what is valuable to us, you know, what are our values, what is important to us and how do we want to serve? And again, that's like no matter what your, you know, what your career looks like, how do we want to serve? Yeah. And when it comes to content marketing, like one thing I often see is like, oh, if your, you know, ideal client is in XYZ place, you need to be on them at all prices and everything. And of course, we need to meet our clients where they are. Mm -hmm. But I think that we also need to find the right middle, at least at this point, because everything is in flow and we evolve. Our clients may evolve as well, but it's like, let's say your ideal client tends to scatter around like three different types of channels or including social media platforms. If one of them, you absolutely hate it, please don't go there. You're going yeah. to make yourself miserable and your audience will be able to tell. Yeah, we are adults. Yeah. We eventually get it. Yeah, such a good point. Wow. So, would you advise people to just stick to one platform or just the ones they enjoy? Maybe is that what you're saying? Yeah, when it comes to social media, so I'm just going to say social media. There, yeah. it's uh, which uh, is like usually their ideal audience is going to be at least on two platforms. I mean, mm. it's a, it's a fair fair assumption and. Like stick to the one where you think you can actually enjoy yourself or at least feel curious about trying to learn it. And mm -hmm. another, another thing I would say is that we still talk a lot about platforms and things, social media, but it's like also keeping in mind, like, you know, blogs or YouTube, because YouTube sometimes get lumped with normal social media. But the thing is that originally it's a search engine and it has such a much uh, longevity, viability, because... Sure, we all want our videos to perform well in the first 48 hours because the algo gods, but at the same time, you may have a video that suddenly, you know, takes off three years later. And yeah. so this is why it does not as ephemeral. So one thing I often advise is like, 
have kind of an evergreen platform. Maybe it's going to be a podcast you're building. Maybe it's a YouTube channel. Maybe it's a blog. And then, you know, one social media, because like it or not, it's still where we may find a lot of our clientele. And yeah, finding like, finding that middle middle ground in content and that works for us, that we're at least curious about trying and where our people are, you know, are going to be is important. And just a very quick note as well is one thing I always advise my client, which is a baseline when you're going to do content marketing. Again, whether you outsource or whether you do everything yourself, you know, depending on where your situation is, is when you create your content pillars, which are like the three to five main topics, every single piece of content you're going to create focus on is finding the middle between what you really love talking about mm -hmm. and what your audience needs and wants. Because I'm like, we need to talk about pain points yet, but also what are your clients' dreams? Yeah. And find the overlap between these two, because then you're going to create value for your audience while still making yourself happier and not completely miserable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so simple when you say it like that, you know, but, you know, I suppose we all over the years, I know I've been drawn into that old school, traditional bro marketing kind of mentality where, you know, as if you have to fit into that. But like, I think more and more um, HSPs and empathic leaders and empathic thought leaders, they're doing it their own way, aren't they? And it's not yes. <laughs> isn't that a good thing. It's amazing. And I yeah. thank you for bringing up the bro marketing. I mean, at this point, I even joke that I'm done with the bro bots because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like between the bots that were created by bros and the actual bros, I'm just like, I'm done. And <laughs> as you know, as a, an empathetic leader and as an HSP, I'm like, you know, that mold doesn't work. Like mm. maybe if, if it's working for some people, go for it. But I mean, I don't have a problem with sales, which is often a thing that many people say, oh, you have a problem with sales. And I'm like, I don't have a problem with sales. I have a problem with the bro culture and the tactics associated with it. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm fine to be talking about the work I do and how it helps others. I'm fine asking my clients for testimonials, you know, the kind of things and supporting and sharing my work. It's just like, I want to do it in a way that feels aligned. Exactly. And, and, and talk to me about, uh, I'm thinking about, you mentioned pain points, right? And many, many times over the years when I'm doing my content, um, as a coach, I would try to express the more positive and aspirational aspects of my work and where I, where I bring my clients, you know, it doesn't feel um, as compassionate for me to, to, to agitate these pain points all the time, do you know? I know. Yes. Which is why, you know, it's one thing to recognize like the issue, like the pain points they are dealing with and how you can help them. But that's also why I'm like, what are their dreams? What are their aspirations? Okay. Yeah. Because yes, I'm here to help you, but I, why are we helping them? You know, it's like, so they can do what, you know, like yeah. in a really positive way. And I don't like agitating the, you know, the pain points either. I mean, it also feels condescending to me sometimes. It's like, yeah, I already know what's going on. I, I'm i not an idiot. Thank you. Yeah. you know, I'm a functional adult, at least most of the time. <laughs> so yes, I prefer to thinking about my goals and how, you know, working with somebody is going to help address whatever that and set me up for success in pursuing my goals or my dreams. Exactly. And I think particularly for a HSP audience, for empathic people, you know, for deep thinkers, we're already thinking deeply we're already there you don't have to kind of bang that drum over and over and over and I think Please that's don't. why marketing just doesn't you know that style of marketing never sits right I think with most HSPs maybe I'm generalizing a little too much I don't know um we find out more and more the more people we speak to and the more speakers here on the summit but um I think yeah we're thinking there we're there already we have a a level of knowledge we're processing deeply already you know so why not bring it to the positive yes and also when you were like please we don't need you to bang that drum yeah with my sensory overload is going to be really nice yeah, no more drums please well, so. <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> oh amazing okay so um 
Tell me as well about self-compassion. We'll come back to self-compassion a little because we want to talk about work-life balance a little bit, don't we? And bringing in more harmony, you know, bringing in the boundaries that you need for more harmony. Can you can you kind of go into that a little? Sure thing. Also, that's why I like saying, you know, harmony over balance, because personally, when I hear balance, I'm just like, this is it. one of the other. Yeah. One or the other. It I love that. It makes me feel like boxed in because there's so much in my work there's so much in my other parts of my life and yeah. it's like I feel like if I'm going to take one wrong step the whole balance is going to crumble where the harmony yeah. there's a better feeling of flow but is it always super flowing no because it's life but at least it feels like I have more options yeah it's, I, I totally agree I, I actually use the term work-life blend sometimes as well you know because it's that kind of like sometimes there is you know more work happening and sometimes there is more personal life happening so absolutely I love the way that you're reframing that to harmony so what do we need to to create more harmony is it more self-compassion self-compassion definitely helps because uh there's I think it also goes back you know of this kind of prescriptive not necessarily pure bra culture but like all the expectation and I think including on us you know women or even gender expensive individual of like oh what may be expected of us, you know, even in a personal way, you know, like the full on, still the ideas that run around, like, oh, you're a woman, you're a caregiver and everything, which we can be, I'm all for it. Uh, but it's also like, at what point do we care for ourselves? Yeah. That's also a big thing. And, but at the same time, you know, the, oh, you should strive and already do 10K a month in your business or, you know, or you should climb up the ladder, you know, if you're in corporate and yeah. like, like, should, I should, think should. From, Mm, shoot oh the shoot uh, that's one Good of land. my pet peeves I talk about a lot can we stop shooting ourselves and I I'm still struggling with that sometimes so I am not perfect I sometimes feel like oh you should and I'm like excuse me sometimes I catch myself sometimes I yeah so do I totally I'm there with you yeah <laughs> but I think it's also like what the self-compassion is also understanding what we want what do what do we really want right now and I'm not talking you know like of specific you know, needs or financial, you know, issues we may have or responsibilities that are like non-negotiable right now, but like outside of, of those, you know, what are the goals we really have, whether it's professionally, like, do we really want to hit like the seven figures in two years because otherwise are we less than, do we absolutely want to have that free promotions in the next five years mm -hmm. because, or, you know, stick with that company or change company, you know, Right. Is it something that society is expecting for us from us or is it something we really want? And like there is no right or wrong answer, you know, in personal, you know, what do we want personally? Like that's also the self-compassion. Like, yeah. do I really want to go chase something hardcore because I really deeply want it? Please go for it. I, I am behind you. I am rooting for you. I am here for it. But maybe it's like, oh, I would like in my personal life, do I really want to travel to X place? Or do I really want to take back up that crafting hobby that I remember sucking at, but at least it was fun, you know, yeah. like also take the productivity and the performance aspect out of our personal life, I think is extremely important and self-compassion can help with that, you know, to remove ourselves from the shooting of like what mm -hmm. our even personal life should look like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're so right. And like, it's, it's quite simple again, when you say it say it out loud but I don't think that I think a lot of people don't give it enough attention you know um you know I would often talk about like what is your version of success what does that feel like and that's also means something simple in your personal life like you say taking up a hobby that maybe maybe you just makes you feel good it doesn't have to be productive all the time I think that's is that a product of you know the generations that we've experienced in terms of like the go, go, go kind of aspect. We're just kind of all drawn into that. I think it's kind of a mix of, I mean, I mean, there, there's like, I mean, when it comes to expectations on on women and generally, and even everybody, but like, especially women, I would say like patriarchal expectation are still, you know, running around of, you know, how things mm -hmm. should look or whatever, like completely. We, we all want to say we're over it, but really we're not over it. Like it's, uh, would be great but like saying we're over it is actually negating so many people's experience yeah. and so much like 
sovereignty opportunities and so much emotional um, intelligence growth needed. And I think like the the world, you know, cap hyper capitalism has also fed into the go go go, you know, mentality mm -hmm. at all times, and uh, and that impacts the go go mentality. I think is really impacting, you know, like the prescriptive approach, no matter what your career is, or even you know, the Instagram worthy personal life. You know, that social media there as well being like, I mean, social media can and the internet can have a lot of benefits. I mean. Without the internet, we wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah. And but it's also like, what can we, you know, how can we dial back from all these, you know, expectation we're bombarded with? Yeah. And again, it's a it's a process. I still fall, you know, for them at time because you know you're tired or you're still like, mm. you know, even are you are you standing in your own power? Sometimes it's like, am I doing the right thing or should I, you know, yeah. dance some cha cha with the algo a little more on the left because or a little <laughs> on the right, like a friend of mine recently said, to make sure I'm a real, you know, uh, carrier person. Mm. Yeah, it's 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 that kind of. Oh, I'll, I'll just I'll just have a quick look just to you know, even though I know I shouldn't, um, I just just compare myself a little bit here. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, just give me a few minutes. I'll just do that and then I'll stop. You know, and I do think that oftentimes those of us that are more sensitive to everything maybe we get drawn in that little bit quicker as well it depends I, I suppose we're back to your point about self-awareness aren't we yeah definitely and and again it's also I think understanding which season we are in in our life and are we a little more tender right now or you know are we actually at the point where we can look for three minutes and be you know away from it it's also like you know talking about you know boundaries it's like I didn't have a smartphone until eight years ago. And while I recognize how helpful it is, I'm like, give me a good old black block uh, cell phones because it was minimizing things. And for me, for example, it's like, I personally am very few social media, like professionally, I'm very active on LinkedIn and uh, I'm also active on YouTube. Like YouTube is probably what I'm going to be using the more mm -hmm. for my personal, you know, enlightenment in my personal life. But for example, if I, I try to be to actively walk like seven to ten thousand steps a day because that's one of the things that helped me a lot wow, and if i'm not going fantastic. to 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 go uh to do that out you know to get outside the house because maybe you know i'm doing it late at night because i've worked a lot or maybe the, the weather is really crappy so one thing i've done for myself is like oh if you're going to watch youtube video then i'm only ever going to watch them on my phone while i'm walking around the house okay well, that's a good one yeah so, yeah, That's I do that I'm... actually myself. I do it maybe on the treadmill, mm. you know, when it's like, okay, what do I have on my, you know, but I have countless playlists, you know, lined up. I'd say I have a good <laughs> few years worth lined up, you know, because it's, 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 it's that kind of place where you, as you say, it can be such a positive experience. You can learn so much. It's just about tempering it and having that, um, harmony I was going to say balance but I'm going to say harmony fantastic um amazing I mean such I could talk to you all day and we've so much more to talk about we have to we have, we're going to have to to meet up again um I love that indeed tell me about your uh your framework that you had mentioned to me before it's called the empress handbook is it is oh, that yeah, a resource that maybe people could avail of yeah Yes. Uh, so the Empress framework is where I bring like the intuitive guidance and even like, you know, content strategy kind of underneath together. But uh, that's basically the framework I use with all my clients since I work with women decision makers and entrepreneurs for the most part, you know, really reclaim their sovereignty and uh, to create a line impact. And the Empress framework is or is a nod to the Empress Major Arcana in Tarot for any of you familiar with because uh -huh. I I've done Tarot for close to twenty five years now. Oh and wow, that's right. One of the way I support my clients and this Empress framework is basically is an acronym that stands for exploration, magic, pleasure, rebellion, expression, sisterhood, and sovereignty. So this has really like the values and what I'm bringing up to life with my clients as well mm. and this empress handbook is a free short ebook that does offer um that does break down each of these seven pillars and mm. add some reflection prompts some affirmation and uh 
if I remember correctly, I have a card spread in it if you enjoy using tarot or oracle cards. And it's kind Fabulous. of, a, you can go over it like in a week or even in, in a day if you were really like, oh, I'm excited about it because I love using reflection prompts so that people can really process and do work on their own. Sure. So that Amazing. gives you an idea of what we may be talking about if, uh, you, you ever decide to uh, consume more of my content or work together definitely yeah I hope we do I really do and I will be checking out uh, that handbook without a doubt um, it, it will be linked um, on the Hey Summit platform on the platform we're on here for the summit so it will be below this talk um, so definitely check that out and look Natasha thank you so much for your time for your energy today it's been an absolute pleasure Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And if anybody has any question, like also feel free to reach out to me on email or on LinkedIn. I mean, my inbox is open. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks, Natasha. See you soon again.